My name is uh, Chris Swanson, and I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at Southeast Orthopedic Specialists. And tonight, we're going to talk about the truth about the rotator cuff. So just a little bit about my background. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Again, I'm double board certified in orthopedic surgery and orthopedic sports medicine. I treat knees and shoulders and see patients of all ages for any problems uh, regarding your knee or your shoulder. I operate on both the knee and the shoulder and treat all conditions, do all surgeries, except for total knee replacements. We have plenty of doctors in our practice that do just hip and knee replacements uh, who can take care of that for you. And then I see patients in our Riverside office, our north side office up by the airport and uh, out at Fleming Island. So again, tonight we're going to talk about the rotator cuff. First, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the rotator cuff, a little bit about rotator cuff disease what imaging you can expect if you're having a problem with your rotator cuff, and then treatment options, both non-surgical and surgical treatment options. And then at the end, uh, we'll take and answer any questions that you have. So the facts about the rotator cuff, rotator cuff disease is an incredibly common problem. It accounts for over 2 million office visits per year uh, throughout the United States. And what we know is that as people get older, uh, the rotator cuff becomes more and more of an issue. And so studies have shown that in patients over 60 years, 60 years old, approximately a quarter of those patients have full thickness rotator cuff tears. And when we get above 80, that number increases to almost 50%. So the rotator cuff are the four muscles and tendons that help that are around the shoulder that help that actively help to move the shoulder. Starting in the front in the picture on the right is the subscapularis muscle and tendon. That's in the front portion of the shoulder. As we move up towards the top of the shoulder, uh, the next muscle and tendon is the supraspinatus tendon. This is the most commonly injured muscle uh, of the rotator cuff. Just behind that is the infraspinatus tendon, which is the large muscle and tendon that you can see uh, again in the picture to the right. And below that is the teres minor. This is a smaller muscle, and this one is typically not injured and is almost never one of the issues that we encounter when dealing uh, with patients with rotator cuff tears. These muscles function together to keep the humeral head, which is the ball, centered within the socket of the shoulder, which allow the larger muscles around the shoulder to work, which is our deltoid muscle, our pec muscle, our biceps. So by keeping that humeral head centered, it lets all those other muscles do their job and allows for all the activities that we do throughout the day. The muscles of the rotator cuff, again, create movements about the shoulder to produce specific rotational motion. When we get a rotator cuff tear, or specifically a massive tear, it disrupts these forces, causing a loss of active motion. The goal of fixing this is that it will restore the anterior and posterior forces to balance these moments and restore active function. And this can occur even if you still don't have a functioning supraspinatus, which again is the most commonly injured muscle. So a little bit about rotator cuff disease. The spectrum of the disease starts with tendonitis and bursitis. Uh, impingement is, is another piece of this. Then you can have partial tears of your rotator cuff, full thickness tears of your rotator cuff, and massive tears. And this can happen to athletes, professional athletes. Paul George, who's a professional basketball player, Cam Newton, who plays in the NFL, uh, have had issues in surgery uh, related to their rotator cuff. It can happen from traumatic events, from falls, from car accidents. Um, and a vast majority of the time, it just happens gradually from wear and tear, from the activities that we do uh, throughout our life. So the first uh, portion of rotator cuff disease that we'll talk about is bursitis and tendonitis. This is by far the most common thing that we see. The shoulder has tremendous range of motion. It's what allows us to move our arm in all directions. It basically can move in a complete circle. And because of this, at some point in our life, almost all of us will get some kind of shoulder pain related to most often, most oftentimes tendonitis and bursitis. It's kind of similar to our low back. Almost no one will wake up without at some point in their life having a little bit of low back pain. And that holds true for the shoulder because there's so much mobility within the shoulder. So the symptoms that you may see from tendonitis and bursitis are pain in the shoulder, weakness, loss of motion, or crepitus or clicking and popping, which you can feel when that bursa becomes inflamed. The picture in the middle shows an MRI of a shoulder where the white area that you can see is that inflamed bursa, which corresponds to the diagram to the right 
Or again, you can see the rotator cuff tendon and above that is the bursa, which sits just below, below the bone on the top of the shoulder, which is the acromion. Next are partial thickness rotator cuff tears. The symptoms of these are very similar to tendonitis and bursitis. When you have a low grade partial thickness tear, it mostly behaves like tendonitis and bursitis, more of an inflammation based problem. As you get into higher grade partial tears, they really can present more like a full thickness tear. And again, to the right, you can see an MRI where the tendon, which is that black structure inserting on the bone, doesn't appear very healthy. And again, there's some inflammation in and around that. So full thickness rotator cuff tears are what people are most worried about. And, and the thing that you never wanna hear from your primary care doctor or your physical therapist or your chiropractor or your orthopedic surgeon um, it's a diagnosis that's somewhat dreaded because oftentimes it means that you do need some surgery in order to fix that tear. And so again, the symptoms are similar, pain, weakness, loss of range of motion, um, and sometimes some clicking and popping. But the big differentiating factor of having a full thickness rotator cuff tear is a loss of strength. And so the classic finding is that you have a hard time raising your arm on your own, but if somebody helps you or if you use your other arm, then you're able to raise that arm above shoulder height. And again, to the right here is another MRI where you can see, again, the, the shoulder, which is that ball in that socket. Above that is the muscle and tendon. And the tendon is now torn and retracted away from where it which should be insert, inserted to the far right of the bone. And finally, massive retractive rotator cuff tears are when tears haven't been treated for an extended period, time, period of time. Again, the symptoms are similar, but these patients have severe loss of motion and severe weakness. So you may not be able to raise your arm at all. Um, and it's something that's called pseudoparalysis. Your arm is not actually paralyzed, but because of the size, severity, and chronicity of the tear, you lose that ability to actively raise your arm. When this happens, the humeral head, or again, the ball starts to rise up until it's actually grinding on that acromion bone, which is the bone that's at the top of the shoulder. And when we see this on an x-ray or an MRI, as you can see to the right, where those bones are touching at the top portion of the screen, we know that this tendon is, a, is a, that this is a very large tear and that's been present for a long time, allowing for that to happen. This is not something that happens acute, acutely, it's something that happens over a period of years. When you start to develop arthritis along with this, it's a condition called rotator cuff arthropathy. So when you're having shoulder pain and you come in to see us in the office and we're worried about uh, diagnosing your problem, where do we start? Well, often we start with an x-ray. Almost everyone who comes into the office, uh, particularly with shoulder pain, will get an x-ray. In the setting of rotator cuff issues, though, these x-rays can be somewhat inconclusive. It still is an important place to start because oftentimes uh, in these days, insurance won't approve any other treatment unless you start with an x-ray. X-rays can show arthritis of both the glenohumeral joint, which is the ball and socket, or the AC or chromioclavicular joint, which is directly above that at the end of the collarbone. It can also show impingement or bone spurs, which can be pinching on uh, the rotator cuff, and it, can, and, and it can certainly show a fracture if you've had some type of a traumatic event. The, the imaging that's more important and where we typically send someone next, especially if we're concerned about a tear, is an MRI. An MRI shows all the soft tissue structures around the shoulder. It will show you the articular cartilage in great detail. It will show you the biceps tendon. It will show you the labrum. And then in particular, it will show you if there's any inflammation in the bursa. And it will show you if their rotator cuff is torn completely. If it's partially torn, it'll show you the quality of the muscle and tendon. And so the MRI is the gold standard for imaging of rotator cuff issues. Here's, a, here's another slide uh, showing two x-rays. The slide on the uh, left side of the screen shows arthritis in the glenohumeral joint. You can see a spur at the bottom of that humeral head or the ball on the left side. Uh, and that means that the arthritis has been present for some period of time. And then on the right side, this shows a massive retracted tear of the rotator cuff where that humeral head again or that ball has risen up and has now actually eroded the undersurface of the acromion. And so again, this is something that's very chronic and been present for a long period of time. So here's an MRI of the shoulder. Again, this is clicking from front to back and the structure that you can see kind of in the middle of the white there is the tendon, which should be attached over to the left side of the humeral head. 
And again, the MRI is our gold standard of imaging to identify rotator cuff issues. In patients who may have pacemakers or specific hardware or spinal cord stimulators or an MRI is not possible, then the next best option is something called a CT arthrogram, which is where you have dye injected into your shoulder and then you have a CT scan. So if anyone has issues with MRI, then a CT arthrogram is our, is our next best option for additional imaging. So what are the treatments, uh, treatment options for rotator cuff disease? It always starts with non-operative options and there's a number of non-operative uh, treatment modalities. The first is activity modification. It's modifying the things that you do, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's at the gym. If you can uh, make accommodations throughout your life that prevents you from having uh, that discomfort, that's the first place to start. The next thing is decreasing inflammation. Again, tendonitis and bursitis is by far most common rotator cuff pathology. And so starting with a prescription strength anti-inflammatory, whether it's um, whether it's over-the-counter first, ibuprofen, Aleve, or prescription strength, meloxicam, diclofenac, those are some of the different anti-inflammatories that you can try, which can help to decrease inflammation. The next step up from that is a cortisone injection. Cortisone is a steroid. That can be injected in the office. Again, it's a stronger, more potent anti-inflammatory, uh, again, with the goal of still decreasing in any inflammation that may be in and around the shoulder and in and around the rotator cuff. When we decrease inflammation, a lot of times the next step is to begin some physical therapy to help to recondition the muscles around the shoulder so that they're able to function in a more uniform pattern to restore first our range of motion and then ultimately the strength to the muscles around the shoulder. Some of the newer options are biologic injections. These include PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. This is where your blood is drawn. It's spun down in the office. It concentrates your body's best growth and healing factors. And then these can be injected into the shoulder, again, typically using an ultrasound. Stem cells are where your stem cells are harvested, uh, generally from your pelvis. And then these can be injected into the shoulder as well. And amnion is another commercially available uh, biologic option. And then if none of these have worked and we're still having issues with the shoulder, then we have to move on uh, to operative options. So these begin with a decompression and bursectomy, which is removal of any bone spurs and removal of the bursa, rotator cuff repair with additional procedures, augmentation and replacement of a patch over the rotator cuff, superior capsular reconstruction, and then finally, uh, in the worst cases, a reverse shoulder replacement if our rotator, if our rotator cuff truly doesn't function. So again, the first and the most simple place to start is with the treatment of bursitis and tendonitis. Non-operatively, we start by decreasing that inflammation, whether it's with anti-inflammatory pills or with an ultrasound-guided cortisone injection, followed by physical therapy. If we move to surgery, it's all done arthroscopically, which is minimally invasive through very small incisions where you go in with the camera and you're able to look at everything inside the shoulder, take pictures of everything, and you remove that bursa and you remove any bone spurs that may be pinching down on the rotator cuff. So ultrasound guided injections, I feel are one of the most important things in conservative management of shoulder conditions. There's a number of great studies that show that the accuracy of an injection into the shoulder is improved dramatically by using an ultrasound or versus by doing it manually without the ultrasound machine. You can get close to 100 or over 90 and almost close to 100% accuracy by using an ultrasound machine. So again, the gold, the gold standard today um, for any type of shoulder injection is the ultrasound machine. There's a number of different places that you can inject into the shoulder from the bursa and above the rotator cuff to into the joint itself, to the AC joint, to the bicipital groove. And the ultrasound allows us to see this in real time. We can watch that needle go into the perfect position. And then we can watch the, the steroid or the anti-inflammatory medicine bathe that area, which, which assures that we're in the right spot, which is good for two reasons. One, we know we've gotten the medicine where we want. If, the, if your symptoms improve completely, then we know we don't need to do anything else. And secondarily, if it doesn't help, well, again, we know that we're in the right place and then we know we need to move on and maybe do something uh, more invasive. So surgical treatment of bursitis and tendonitis, this is an arthroscopic picture of an inflamed bursa. It looks like a spider web. Um, and when you're in the subacromial space, which is above the rotator cuff and somebody who has severe bursitis, this is what it looks like. You then utilize something called a shaver, 
which helps to remove this person, restore this space. And so on this next slide, we can now see this space. And below us, the white that you see below that is the top tendon of the rotator cuff. And then above that, you can see the undersurface of the acromion, which is the bone on the top of the shoulder and a large bone spur um, that the arrow is pointing to. And that's part of what causes that bursa to become so inflamed and so irritated. And so by removing that spur and flattening that out, we increase that space between the acromion and the rotator cuff, which improves our range of motion, prevents that bursitis from coming back and helps to alleviate our pain. So next we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about the treatment of partial thickness rotator cuff tears. Again, it starts with simple things like decreasing inflammation, physical therapy for exercise, uh, exercises. And, and the goal really of physical therapy and the treatment of any of these conditions is to spend a little bit of time with the therapist to get comfortable doing exercises, to learn a regimen of exercises that you can do on your own at home, and then to transition with some bands and some light weights to doing these on your own at home and developing, developing a a regimen that you can do two or three times a week for 10 or 15 minutes to keep the muscles in both your shoulders nice and strong, which will help you to stay active. And so the next treatment line for partial thickness rotator cuff tears does involve those biologic injections. And then finally, if none of this works, uh, surgery is certainly an option for this. And so there's, a, biologics is kind of the hot topic in a number of things from hair regeneration to orthopedic surgery and a number of different uh, things we hear about it in the media all the time. Uh, and there's the evidence is coming. We don't have the evidence that we need yet. And that's why insurance still typically doesn't pay for any of these biologic injections. But almost every day there's a new study coming out talking about the efficacy of biologics that we can use in orthopedics. And partial thickness rotator cuff tears are one of the areas where there's good evidence that you can see substantial improvements for patients in terms of both their pain. And then also you can see the tendons start to heal over time. And so here's an example of one of our patients uh, with, who underwent an ultrasound guided PRP or platelet rich plasma injection. The picture on the top is a picture of the tendon at the time of the injection. And again, you can see sort of that white gray area and without looking at a lot of these, it, it may not look like anything special, but um, you can see that, that that looks very diseased and it doesn't look healthy. So PRP, again, taking the patient's own blood, which was spun down and concentrating their best growth and healing factors was then injected under ultrasound guidance. And at six weeks, they returned. And that same ultrasound, you can see a much more distinct tendon, uh, tendinous structure. And you see a lot less of that white gray substance, which is your tendonitis, bursitis, and inflammation. And so that tendon looks a lot healthier just six weeks after having a PRP injection. And again, the nice part about this is this is, is using your body's best growth and healing factors. Partial thickness kick tears are also amenable to placement of a patch. Um, the patch can be placed over a partial thickness tear. This is an arthroscopic image of that patch. You can see it outlined in the blue. It's held in position uh, by these dissolvable purple staples and it sits over a partial thickness tear. It's then incorporated into the tendon and helps to uh, provide support to the tendon and then it helps the, the tendon to become thicker and stronger uh, and this can be easily placed arthroscopically. The nice part about this if you have a partial thickness tear is that this is something you can typically recover from and be back to all activities in about two to three months. So now back to full thickness rotator cuff tears. These are the ones, you know, that we always, that people worry about the most. This is the one, the dreaded diagnosis that no one wants to hear if they're having shoulder pain and they're having difficulty moving that arm. But the surgery is very effective. These are ones, you know, where if you're under 75 years old or so and you have a full thickness tear of that rotator cuff with severe weakness, this is really something that you need to fix with surgery. Once that tendon's not attached to the bone anymore, it can't bridge that gap. It can't reattach itself to the bone. There's nothing that's going to restore uh, that mechanical property. And over time, if it's detached from the, from the bone for an extended period of time, it will continue to pull further and further away from the bone. We don't know exactly how quickly that can occur, but eventually it will pull far enough away that you actually are unable to reattach it. So when we do need to fix a full thickness rotator cuff tear, the surgery again is done all arthroscopically, which is minimally invasive. It's an outpatient surgery. It takes approximately one hour. You go home the same day. 
you do have to wear a sling for the first month. Certainly the most difficult part of rotator cuff surgery is the rehab and recovery process afterwards. Um, the sling, again, after one month, you're able to transition out of the sling. Therapy begins about two weeks after the surgery. And for the first three months, which we know is how long it takes for that tendon to heal back to the bone, we focus on restoring our passive range of motion. So at the end of that three months, we want to have nearly symmetric range of motion or the motion that we have on the other side. From there, we focus on strengthening. It takes another two to three months to restore our strength and sometimes even a little bit longer if we haven't used that, sh that shoulder normally for an extended period of time. So it does take the better part of five or six months to get completely better from rotator cuff surgery. And again, the surgery is performed arthroscopically, which is minimally invasive. The benefit to this is that it improves our visualization. Again, we're able to take pictures that we're able to email you immediately after the surgery. It also improves the mobility of the tissue. Uh, our repairs, we perform knotless, which means that we don't tie any knots in your tendon. So there's no abrasion or irritation of the tissue after the surgery. There's been a paradigm shift in rotator cuff repairs over the past 20 or 25 years. They used to be done with open surgeries and large incisions. This is, this is basically a thing of the past. There's now a limited role uh, for open rotator cuff surgery. And there's a number of reasons, like I just mentioned, that these should be done arthroscopically. So here's an example of a full thickness rotator cuff tear. This is an arthroscopic image of one of our patients. This is looking from the outside or the lateral aspect of the shoulder. The structure at the top that you can see is the rotator cuff tendon. Below that is a little bit of the remnant of the tendon, sort of that uh, crab-like looking material is a re some remnant of the tendon uh, that's still attached to the bone. And then looking straight ahead, you can actually see the socket or the glenoid of the shoulder. And so you shouldn't be able to see that. You should see that tendon at the top attached to the bone. And so this is a problem. And this is why somebody would have pain. This is why they would have weakness. This is why they would have loss of range of motion. And this is why you would want to get this fixed with an arthroscopic surgery, because again, without reattaching that to the bone, you're going to be unable to regain your normal strength. So here's how we'll fix this. This is the actual surgery fixing that uh, tear that I just showed you. The first video here on the left is us inserting the first dissolvable screw into the bone. The dissolvable screw has sutures that are attached to it. So this screw is carefully inserted into the bone, again, under direct visualization while we're looking directly at it. It's at the articular margin, which is where that tendon should attach. And so then once this screw is completely inserted, we back that screwdriver up and we remove that. And now we have strands of suture that we can use to pass into the tendon in order to then pull that over and reattach it. And so now we'll move on to the video on the right. This is a suture passer that's utilized to pass that suture into the tendon where we take a nice solid bite of that tendon. The suture will come out from underneath the tendon to the top. And then you can see this, it'll be pulled back out, which is what will ultimately allow us to pull this tendon over and reattach it to the bone. And so there's that suture, which is now completely through that tendon. That suture is then pulled over further to the side and it's incorporated into a second anchor. This is the second anchor going in further over to the side of the bone which is what allows those sutures to be pulled over and to reattach that tendon to the bone. It's the similar type of anchor. It's again, dissolvable uh, as was placed before. And so your typical rotator cuff repair will involve four of these anchors. In larger, pairs, in, in larger repairs, it sometimes necessitates six anchors, but about 95% of the repairs can be uh, performed with four anchors. And then now the final video on the right is a picture of the completed repair. So you can see that that tendon has been completely compressed down to the bone. You can see the two anchors over to the side. Um, and that's a really nice repair of that tendon. Now you can know, you'll notice that you can no longer see the glenoid or the socket inside the shoulder. And so this should have a tremendous ability to heal. This is a very strong con construct. It allows for immediate passive range of motion and again, like we said, the tendon still takes about three months to completely heal back to the bone. This construct will hold it in place. We still need your body and your biologics to heal that tendon back in place. 
So that's my preferred technique. That's how we perform the majority of our rotator cuff repairs. Um, again, it's done all knotless, so there's no knots above the tendon which can abrade or rub on the bone. It gets great compression of the tendon and allows your body a chance to heal that back into place. So additional procedures along with rotator cuff tears that are common uh, are, are addressing your biceps tendon. The biceps, which you can see a picture of at the bottom right here, is often diseased when we have a rotator cuff tear. That picture of the biceps there shows a high grade partial thickness tear of the biceps in the setting of a rotator cuff tear. This can contribute significantly to pain that we feel deep within the shoulder, especially in the, especially in the anterior or the front part of the shoulder. Another common issue that we see in conjunction with rotator cuff tears are slap tears. Slap stands for the superior labrum. So the labrum is the cartilage that rims the entire inside portion of the shoulder socket. And slap stands for superior labrum, moving from anterior, posterior, front to back, which is right where this biceps tendon inserts. So slap tears are again, commonly seen in conjunction with rotator cuff tears. They're also seen when we start to get arthritis in our shoulder. There's a number of studies that show that in patients over 40 or 50 years of age, almost everybody will have some degree of tearing of their labrum. Repairing slap tears has fallen out of favor, especially in the setting of a rotator cuff repair. We found that patients can get very stiff if that's repaired at the same time. And so it's much better to actually address the biceps. And by removing the biceps from the labrum, you take the tension off of the labrum. You can reattach the biceps either arthroscopically or through a small incision at the top of the armpit, which will allow the biceps to look the same, work the same, and it will remove that diseased portion of the biceps tendon. And so here's a picture of a, a biceps tenodesis, which is reattaching that biceps tendon. That's a very small incision, only about a three or so centimeter incision at the top of the armpit. It's being stretched with retractors, but once that heals, you actually can hardly see that incision. And then that biceps is trimmed, the disease portion is removed, and it's reattached through that small metal button that you can see in the x-ray to the right, which holds it in position, allows it to heal, allows you to get full strength back with that biceps, but removes it from the labrum and will prevent you from getting stiff in conjunction with your rotator cuff repair. So the future of rotator cuff repair is in biologic, is in improving the biologic healing environment. And so again, there's studies that are occurring daily that are coming out daily regarding the placement of stem cells, augmenting repairs with stem cells, with PRP, with PRP platelet-rich plasma, with pl placing patches that can be incorporated into your repair that are bathed in these substances. And so improving that healing environment is gonna hopefully eventually lead to more rapid healing, which may ultimately lead us to be able to speed up that rehab process and maybe trim a few months off of that and speed up the recovery, allowing people to get back to the activities that they'd like to do at a quicker pace. So what about irreparable rotator cuff tears? These are the tears that have gotten so big that we can't fix. And so this is something that we have some great new options on that historically 10, 15, 20 years ago, we had no good options for. And so even irreparable tears, whether it's identified at the time of surgery or whether it's identified over an MRI, now have excellent options that can restore function. So no matter how bad your tear is, we have an option for you. In younger patients that have no arthritis, the best option is something called a superior capsular reconstruction. This actually replaces the supraspinatus tendon, which again is the tendon at the top of the shoulder. It requires that the remainder of the rotator cuff tendons are intact as we have to suture this patch that's placed into the position of the supraspinatus to the surrounding tendons in order to regain function and range of motion. And so on this diagram to the right, you can see the patch in the center, which has again the sutures coming through it, and it's sutured to the tendon in the front, which is your subscapularis tendon, and the tendon in the back, which is the infraspinatus tendon. This is an arthroscopic image. The image on the left is an arthroscopic image of a rotator cuff tear that can't be repaired. That tendon is retracted too far. You can see the tendon at the top, that kind of yellow structure. It's retracted back to the level of the glenoid or the socket. It's basically flush with that. And we try to release it as much as we can, and we pull on it with a, a grasper to try to mobilize it to bring it back over to the front portion of that image. But in this case, it just won't move. 
And so in this scenario, we can place that patch. And to the right, you can see two images of the patch. The patch then covers this empty space. It's connected to the socket with sutures uh, and, and small tacks that go into the bone that allow those sutures to pull that patch into position. And then it's secured on the outside, similar to what we talked about with the rotator cuff repair, where the sutures are passed up through the graft and then secured in position with those dissolvable screws. And this is a very new procedure. It's something we've been doing more and more of over the past five years. It's something that, that's become uh, fairly common. But 10 or 15 years ago, this was not an option that was available. And in the right patient, in someone who's younger, who doesn't have substantial arthritis, these people can do very, very well. And so here's a video of, some, of one of our patients who had this procedure done. This is at his six month follow -up point, uh, appointment. He had no functioning supraspinatus tendon. We repaired, we returned we, uh, to surgery, we placed that patch. And uh, at the end of his rehab process, you know, I challenge you to be able to decide which arm he had surgery on. And so this is an excellent outcome from this surgery. So in older patients who have arthritis, what do we do if we can't fix your rotator cuff? Again, this is an option that we didn't have 20 years ago. But now we have an excellent option and it's a, it's a shoulder replacement. It's actually something called a reverse shoulder replacement. This changes the mechanics of the shoulder. It switches the ball in the socket and it places a metal ball on the socket side of the shoulder and a plastic and metal cup on the ball on the uh, on the uh, socket on the, what was previously the socket side of the shoulder. By doing this, it changes the mechanics of the shoulder. Now, the arm and the shoulder no longer rely on the rotator cuff to achieve range of motion. Our deltoid muscle, which is the muscle that had pre previously moved our arm to the side, can now be trained to raise our arm in front of us. This surgery provides excellent pain, pain relief for people who have pain from arthritic changes. The only, issue, the, the only issue or compromise with this surgery is that because you're changing the mechanics of the shoulder, you do want to limit your heavy lifting. 10, 15, 20 pounds is something that you want to do your best uh, to stick by because of the mechanics of the implant, not because of the surgery or because of how much strength you may have. You just don't want that shoulder to disassociate or dislocate. And so limiting heavy lifting is important after a reverse shoulder replacement. Here's two x-rays of reverse shoulder replacements, uh, different options. Uh, as time has gone on, we continue to improve uh, the, the implants that we use during this surgery. You can see the implant to the right has a shorter stem that actually goes into the humerus. Um, this, this requires less reaming and is less painful. And so we continue uh, to make improvements to these uh, implants to improve the surgical outcomes. This is what, again, one of my patients, the video on the left is asking this patient to move her shoulder. You can see that she actually, let's go back. So you can see that she's actually not moving her shoulder at all. She can't move her shoulder. That's her x-ray in the middle. Uh, she can only move her elbow. After the shoulder replacement, she's able to move her shoulder, get it above shoulder height, able to touch the top of her head, get things out of a low cabinet, and for somebody who was not able to move her shoulder at all, this was just a tremendous improvement for her. She said she hadn't been able to do her hair in approximately five years to wash her hair, brush her hair. And so she was just ecstatic with this. And actually you can even get better range of motion than she was able to achieve. And so here's another example of a patient about six months out from another reverse shoulder replacement. You can see on the right, his movement, moving his head, Above shoulder height, he's basically able to achieve full range of motion, get that arm all the way up. And then similarly, in rotating external rotation out to the side, it's almost exactly the same mobility that he has on his left shoulder, which he had no surgery on. So this is a tremendously powerful tool for older patients who have arthritis. It can also be used in, in patients who have a bad proximal humerus fracture, with an, if there's a number of small pieces, you can replace the shoulder, but it's a very powerful tool. And again, it helps people who otherwise had no good surgical option and might have extremely limited range of motion with their shoulder. Now there's an excellent option for these patients. We do all of our shoulder replacements, specifically these reverse shoulder replacements in a patient specific fashion. Uh, what that means is that we send every single patient to get a CT scan 
The CT scan of the shoulder then allows us to use technology to plan a custom shoulder that's built individually for each specific patient. There's software that allows us to do this where we plan uh, both the humeral side and the glenoid or socket side, which allows us to customize this so that it fits perfectly into each individual's anatomy. We've been doing these patient-specific shoulders for over eight years, and we've planned more uh, custom shoulders than anyone in Northeast Florida. So the take-home message is that rotator cuff issues are extremely common. Rotator cuff tendonitis and bursitis is most likely something that everyone will experience at least a degree of throughout their lifetime. Um, rotator cuff tears oftentimes manifest as, without a specific injury. They just gradually increase in size over time until that sort of straw that breaks the camel's back moment when you start to have a significant increase in pain, loss of range of motion and weakness. The good news is that many of these conditions can be treated non-operatively. So it means that if you come in to see me, there's a good chance that you'll walk out without needing to have surgery. And the, secondarily, if you do end up needing surgery, we have a repertoire of minimally invasive surgical options that can restore the rotator cuff and restore your function. And so early intervention leads to early return to activities, whatever those activities may be. So if your shoulder hurts, don't waste time. Come in, get it checked out. There's a good chance you won't need to have surgery on it, but don't wait in pain. Don't miss that opportunity to fix these things in a relatively easy fashion. So now we'll take some questions. So um, that's a good question. Thank you for that question. When we start talking about pain that's coming from the shoulder, from the rotator cuff, the rotator cuff and the, and the structures within the shoulder can only cause pain from about up here to about halfway down the top portion of our arm. If we're having pain that's going further down our arm to our elbow, past our elbow to the wrist or into our fingers, we become more and more concerned about whether we're irritating or pinching a nerve either at our elbow, at our wrist, or possibly at our neck. And so in terms of a sleeping position, one, it sounds like you're having pain that's going down the entire arm, which may mean you're irritating the nerve. So keeping your neck in a neutral position and making sure you have a, a pillow that allows you to do that is probably the most important thing. From a shoulder standpoint, there is no position that can completely alleviate pain that may be coming specifically from your shoulder. Sometimes the best thing to try if it really seems like it's coming from your shoulder and what patients will often do after surgery is to sleep in a reclining chair for a few days where you stay centered, where your arm can't get into an awkward position and where you're not doing as much rolling side to side. So scar tissue, especially if you've had a previous surgery can certainly have something to do um, with the level of pain in your, sh in, in your shoulder. And that's really why the rehab process after any shoulder surgery, but specific rotator, specifically rotator cuff surgery is so important. Beginning physical, physical therapy promptly at about 10 to 14 days after surgery is critical to prevent the formation of scar tissue. If you get too much scar tissue after surgery, it can significantly limit your range of motion. If your motion becomes limited, when any joint has limited range of motion, it can become very painful. Um, again, good question. If surgery is not, you know, is not recommended for your condition, the best thing to do is to get with a physical therapist. Um, and again, there's a, we have physical therapists in almost all of our offices, and there's a number of community therapy um, uh, companies that we work with around uh, Jacksonville, is to go and see a physical therapist. They're experts. They're experts in teaching people the proper exercises with the proper technique and the proper mechanics, making sure you have the tools that you need, whether it's bands, light weights, they'll give you handouts of the exercises, ensure that you're doing them properly. And so the best thing is to see a physical therapist to let them guide you through the appropriate exercises to do. And again, a lot of times we're not talking about months of physical therapy or eight, 10, 12 visits of therapy. A lot of times you can go one or two times, work with them, and develop a program that then you can do on your own at home. And in terms of activities that you avoid, that depends a little bit on what condition you're dealing with. 
But from a, a general or broad sense, if there's specific activities that are bothering you while you're rehabbing it and working on your exercises, you want to avoid those specific activities that are painful. Uh, age is important for rotator cuff surgery. Uh, studies show that as we get to around 70 and then over 70, the quality of our rotator cuff tendon and the quality of our bone start to decrease. And so um, over 70, you need to be a little bit more cautious and a little bit more judicious and make sure that on an MRI that the an x-ray that the tendon and bone quality look good. Once we start to get over 75, that's when we start to become very concerned about our healing potential from a rotator cuff standpoint. And that's when we may have more frank discussions about if a shoulder replacement is potentially the right option for you. Great question. Um, so the overhead throwing motion, one, is tremendously taxing on the shoulder. And so for people who played overhead sports growing up or have continued to throw uh, overhead or perform overhead activities, the hardest thing that we do with our shoulder is throwing anything overhead, whether it's a baseball, whether it's a football, whether it's serving in tennis, um, serving in volleyball even, that overhead motion is not a natural motion for our shoulder. So for since we're talking specifically about rotator cuffs, what we expect for our patients is that between five and six months, they can be back doing almost any activity. So very predictably, people can be back in the gym, lifting weights, playing golf, playing tennis. But when we're talking about that overhead throwing motion, that's the thing that can take a little bit longer. So again, around five to six months, I'd expect that you'd be able to start throwing, but can you throw full speed? Can you throw as fast or hard as you used to? That's something that can definitely take some additional time. And what you need to know about that going into surgery is that there's really no exact time point. So that could be three more months, six more months, nine more months, even a year, because that overhead throwing motion requires so much strength and so much flexibility that's beyond what we normally use. So it can be used in both settings and it can also be used during surgery. Um, and so there's a role for biologics in all of those settings, and it depends on exactly what you're dealing with. So before surgery, it's excellent for partial thickness rotator cuff tears. During surgery, it's an excellent option to augment full thickness tears or your repair. And after surgery, it can be used to augment that healing process. So there's a role for it in all three. It just kind of depends on exactly what you're dealing with. And again, um, there's going to be more and more coming out on biologics in the next five to 10 years. I believe that during that time, we'll accumulate enough evidence where insurance will actually start to pay for some of these procedures in the appropriate setting. Um, and again, currently, they're excellent options. The only downside is, um, is that insurance just won't cover them right now. The bursa tissue, which is an area that fluid can collect, which we have in a number of places throughout our body. There's one on our elbow, there's one on the side of our hip, there's one in the front of our kneecap, and the one that we've been talking about, which is above the rotator cuff. It, they, it is a structure that can, um, can come back. You can get inflammation in that. It can uh, regenerate to some extent, and you can get inflammation in there again. Typically, it takes a long time if the bursa is removed for it to come back and to be symptomatic. If it does, uh, especially in the early setting after a surgery, generally then one injection can really calm that down and pretty much help that to go away completely. But yes, there are cases where it can come back down the road um, and it can require removal a second time. There's different evidence on that. Generally speaking, we typically start with one injection uh, and we, we track how much improvement you get with that one injection. And we're again able to visualize that on the ultrasound like we showed you. And if we're seeing some improvement, if, if over the course of four to six weeks, we feel like we've improved 50% along with the therapy that we would do with that, then we might consider a second injection to get us from 50% to 100%. There's no consensus on whether one injection is best or whether a series is best. And so my feeling is that the best way is to start with one, see how much improvement you get and kind of go from there. 